the cloud. Let's see if we can get get this going. And, uh, and so, um, in in any case, um, this this week we've got about 20 years from 1960 to 1980ish, um, which and I know all of you you were just kids back then, but um, maybe you were beginning to, to take some pictures um, on your own. I know we, we shared um, some of the uh, stories about our, our cameras. Um, and so what I wanted to do is start off with um, a couple cameras that I, I used way back when. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, Nikon F. This was made in the um, early to mid 60s. And it was the first Nikon professional camera, 35 millimeter that um, you know, newspaper guys used. I, I started in the newspaper business in 1973, but um, I you know, was using some older stuff. Um, this was actually the first thing I used. Um, and uh, it was new back then. In any case, um, what you ended up doing, a lot of these older cameras, um, you ended up um, loading the film from the bottom of the camera right here so that you would put the film in uh, and then you would have to put the cover back on and lock it on the bottom here. And this was a, a manual camera back in the early 60s. Um, what was good for photojournalists was that you had an ASA, which went up to 6,400. The a ASA is what is called the ISO now. It's the same thing. It's the speed of the film. And of course, now it's the, sp the speed of uh, in digital. Um, so you had the speed up to 6,400 ASA. And then you also had the, the uh, camera speed um, went all the way up to a thousandth of a second. And that was really fast back in the early 60s um, until, you know, at this point, the most of the cameras were 500th of a second in their speed. And of course, now you can go up to uh, 4,000 or 8,000th of a second and higher with your, with your speeds with the digital. And the um, bayonet mount on the front, and you basically um, attached your lenses to the camera back then. It was not a one camera unit. It was two different parts, the body and the lens. And so it had a lot of interesting um, gadgets on it for the professional, but it was pretty simplistic back in the early 70s. Back um, in the late, late 60s, the uh, cameras came out, Canon came out and Mamiya Secor came out with cameras that allowed you to do a few more things with the um, automation, uh, auto exposure. So starting in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, um, the um, SLRs came out that allowed you to start doing uh, controls where the um, speed of the camera or the aperture of the camera was um, automatically adjusted for you. And then you had to set the other part of the exposure. If the automatic was the uh, aperture, you had to set the speed and vice versa. If the automatic was the speed, you had to set the aperture. And this was about 1967, 1968. This, this was my father-in-law's camera, and um, he duct taped a roll onto the strap, so he had an extra roll uh, with him when he was going out taking pictures, which I thought was very clever. Um, and uh, he was a photographer all the way from the age of 13, and he had his own dark rooms, and he mixed his own chemistry. He'd go to the pharmacy, and he would buy all of his um, chemicals for the dark room. And then he would mix them himself and then do all of the developing 
uh, in the dark room with his um, uh, developing trays and then he would uh, make his own prints. So um, he, he was a, an, an avid amateur photographer throughout his life um, and he was still taking pictures in his 80s. He, he lived to be 89 and um, he gave this camera to me um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago uh, when he got another one. Um, so it's coming in handy for demonstrations. <laughs> and uh, this particular mount here is a screw mount. So any lens that you got for the Mamiya Secor, you would screw in. Um, and, and so you've got two basic uh, ways to put lenses in cameras. You've got the bayonet mount and you've got the screw mount. Most of the cameras now have the bayonet mount um, for, um, for kind of ease and putting the camera lens on quickly. Um, last but not least, my little demonstration. Uh, this camera was um, in the mid 70s, made to the late 70s. This is a two and a quarter it's called a Mamiya M645. So they you know, used 120 millimeter film and the, uh, the film was divided into um, six centimeters and 4.5 centimeters. That's why it was the Mamiya 645. And this camera I used um, for my own personal use uh, for landscape photography. Um, and I didn't use this for newspaper stuff. And I remember this was a gift from my mother. Um, and um, it, back then this was not cheap, but this was the poor man's Hasselblad. So um, I, I was able to afford at least a two and a quarter camera, which is one of my dreams. And of course I was a very spoiled brat, spoiled kid. And so my mother um, bought this for me uh, for my birthday. And um, so you can, you can still use this if you can find the film. Um, but eventually, of course, all these cameras, even the two and a quarter cameras uh, went to digital. So you get a digital two and a quarter camera now, as well as a digital 35 millimeter camera now. And um, the manual and the film has uh, certainly um, has gone from normal use. But this was a beautiful camera. All these lenses were absolutely fantastic lenses. Um, and one thing I'm doing now is uh, I'm taking lenses and putting adapters on them and I'm putting, I'm using those lenses um, on my um, digital cameras. So if you can, you can actually buy um, adapters now that you can put older manual lenses on your newer digital cameras and um, and you're not wasting the lenses that you had over the years even if they're 30 or 40 years old if you look hot enough you can find an, uh, an adapter that will go from one lens um, ring to another lens ring one bayonet size to another bayonet size so it, it's really um, uh, Pretty neat. I've been using some of my old Mamiya lenses, and the glass in those were absolutely fantastic. So, um, now does does anyone remember the uh, earliest camera they they had when they were taking pictures? Um, anyone can chime in. Uh, was it an an old? Uh, was it a Polaroid? Was it a uh, Kodak Instamatic? Was it a um, any anyone remember that far back? Way back. Yeah, I had a Kodak Instamatic and a Polaroid uh, in my uh, probably late sixties, and yeah, with those. Actually, uh, I did some of my own developing when I was like in seventh grade. <laughs> oh, terrific! And I was uh, doing all right. Uh, you know, I'd be in the bathroom with the lights out, and I uh, did all right. Yeah, the um, the uh, Instamatic was very popular, uh, wasn't it? And the Kodak Instamatic, for those of you who weren't aware, um, you you had a plastic unit 
you opened up your little camera and you, you put the plastic uh, unit in the camera um, and it then caught, caught on and you went through, what was it, 24 exposures or something, then you took the entire plastic unit out and sent it to, for processing. Um, this kind of was, was easier than um, taking a roll of film and, and trying to catch the roll of film on the other part of the camera. Uh, the, um, and, and so the Kodak Instamatic was, was truly a, a consumer camera that made it easy. And they were trying to um, you know, compete with the Polaroid um, cameras for ease, um, but using film. Francine's got a camera that um, she's got in front here. What type was that, at Francine? It's a ZXM Pentax. Do you know what year that roughly was or what decade? No, and I just found them under, under my desk in a suitcase. I had a few. It's not the one I'm using now, but it's an older one. That looks like maybe the, the 70s. You think so? Maybe the early know, 80s. There's this 32X, a digital zoom. Yeah, that might be in the 2000s. I mean, you know, early 2000s or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, all the way through the, um, the 60s and 70s, it was just an amazing amount of development from a technology point of view. And I'm gonna pop right into uh, uh, a little bit of uh, the slides here and uh, just uh, bear with me and see if we can get get over to uh, sharing the screen here. And um, so I'll see if this, are you seeing the full screen guys? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I wanted, wanted to start with um, just sharing some of the photographers uh, that, that were kind of influential in, in, the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And one of the uh, photographers was uh, an American photojournalist uh, by the name of William Jean, Eugene Smith. And um, again, what, what he did was um, tell, tell great stories um, about life in, in, in this country. And um, he really was what kind of the, the father of the uh, de development of the editorial photo essay. And he did essays on uh, World War II and um, he, he did a lot of um, essays um, in, um, in his career. Uh, and he, uh, he shared most of this work with um, Life Magazine, and they in Life Magazine he was recognized as the first extended editorial photo story uh, photographer. So um, one of the things that were big in the in the 60s and 70s and even the early 80s uh, was the photo essay, and you would see these, of course, in uh, Life Magazine. You would also see these in uh, major newspapers around the country, and one of the big things that uh, made photojournalism popular uh, when I was getting into it was the fact that um, we could tell uh, stories and document things uh, with a photo essay. And um, that was really something that most photographers love to do. It was, it was sort of like you did the day-to-day -day stuff, but, but to do the photo essay was a real special thing. And, um, and, and that kind of gave you the feeling that you were a true photojournalist. You, you told a story uh, in pictures and not with just one picture, but a series of pictures, sometimes one full page of pictures, uh, which I did uh, throughout my career in Chicago and, and uh, he, even here in, in the, at the Sentinel. Uh, they supported the photo essay, which is one reason I, I went to the Sentinel is they take pictures very seriously as a, as a part of journalism. And um, so basically um, you, you've got your typical, you know, um, uh, life as it really uh, is um, in your, your essays. 
Um, you didn't really mince any words, um, which, which is really what the photo essay was supposed to do. It was not supposed to be light and fluffy. It was supposed to be strong and tell a story without a whole lot of words. There were um, captions and there were text blocks, but most of the photo essays were completely um, uh, photos uh, and they, they told a story. And, and again, it was different parts of life uh, in this country that, that, that he was known for in his photo essays. So um, as I alluded to, um, hey, hey, Steve. Mr. Land, Hey Jeff, you there? Yeah. Finally here. Finally found the link. Um, you're still in, you're in speaker mode. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, speaker mode. Okay. Um, I need to be in gallery mode. Well, well, I think I think in terms of your uh, your presentation, you're in the speaker mode um, as opposed to the you know presentation. You know, use oh. use a little little. Uh, uh, the no slide screen thing for your uh, okay. So you're showing the presenter mode is what you're saying. Pre yeah, you're in presenter mode. You're showing presenter mode. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back here. There you go. No, that's you. <laughs> that's me. And I'm going to get over here and. Okay. Well, we could go. If you look at your look at PowerPoint, you ought to go down to use a little uh, little uh, projector screen button. Yeah, Jeff, do you see the full screen? You got it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. I appreciate okay. that. Uh, I welcome welcome to our our Friday session. Yeah, I couldn't find the link for a while. Yeah. Um, so in, in 63, I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Land started developing all of his stuff in the late 50s, but um, as I alluded to last week, but it was really the early 60s that the Polaroid really hit the market. And by the late 60s, early 70s, um, most of America had some type of um, Polaroid camera. Um, it, it was sort of the easy thing to do, it was the consumer thing to do. And, and of course, um, I th think maybe, I don't know if, I'm, I think Kodak tried to do something and had their butt sued, um, but trying to do something uh, on the Polaroid end of things. I don't know if any of you uh, recall that argument, but um, I think, I think um, at some point, um, you know, Kodak tried to come out with something that was, was similar. Um, and, and so in any event, um, that was in the early 60s. Um, Jeff, you out there? Yeah, I'm here. What, what was the first camera that, that, uh, that you remember using? Uh, like, was it um, 35 millimeter or, or was it two and a quarter or I had a, I had a, my, my father gave me a, a 30, his old 35 millimeter film camera when I was like in junior high. So okay. everyone, everyone else was shooting Instamatics and Polaroids back then. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, um, um, I, I bought an Instamatic, um, in the Blacklands <clears throat> trip in 1963 and, um, took my, some of my first landscape pictures on a Kodak Instamatic. And uh, it wasn't until late 60s that I got into the uh, single lens reflexes. And um, so I think, I think my very first camera reflecting back was, was 1963 Kodak Instamatic. So that was, um, that was the big thing. And again, uh, the Kodak Instamatic was introduced in 1963 and it became hugely popular. Everyone wanted one and they were, I don't know, back then, $25, I think, something like that, maybe $30, um, which was quite a bit of money in 1963. Um, well, we had um, worldwide uh, 
work with with many photographers and and um you know the uh in japan this um this guy uh Shomei tomatsu uh, he he was um you know not really a world famous photographer but again he he was getting into shooting um more documentary work and, and it just seemed like the cameras were smaller uh, as I alluded to in the last section, uh, um, more and more uh, people were out there uh, able to shoot uh, daily life uh, out in the world. You had, um, uh, you know, I think I sent you the 70s um, uh, photography of video. Um, you know, everyone was taking street photography and they were documenting life um, all the way, not just newspaper photographers, but everybody um, was documenting uh, life um, you know, in, in America, and um, it, it got to be that, that most of the people had one type of camera or another, uh, and not <laughs> just the profession. You know, so that was the big thing in the in the 60s and 70s, as we saw, uh, not just specialists coming out um, with doing their own thing, but the consumer market out there taking tons of pictures um, and um, just ma a mass uh, camera coverage mass documentation um, that was happening. And of course, it's true today, um, you know, with the uh, digital smartphone, um, everyone is taking pictures um, and, um, but, but it started in the 60s and 70s uh, with the consumer market. It's another, another shot here of um, the, the Japanese photographer, but again, these, these were for candidates. Uh, big thing with the document, documentation, documentary work was, was not that nothing posed. Um, we had this, uh, Leonard Nielsen, who again was um, um, somebody who specialized in um, some close-up work uh, in macro photography. So as you got the um, increased technology, you were able to continue to um, get into um, photography that that got into macro work. You had photography that, that got into all sorts of different uh, areas uh, due, to, due to the uh, improvements from technology. So this gentleman uh, was from Sweden and I'll tell you, he, he, um, this was way back, um, you know, in the, um, uh, the 60s and he started getting stuff like this, um, you know, back then which was just amazing. I remember seeing this series in Life magazine. Um, it was just, just fascinating um, when, when these pictures came out. Um, and uh, to get these type of pictures what was really amazing um, back, back in those days. And um, so you had, um, believe it or not, in 73, I found this, the Fairchild Semiconductor makes the first large image forming a CCD chip for digital cameras. Now, large is in, in quotes because for its time, it was 10K pixels. Now, that's, you know, one-tenth of one megabyte, if I'm not mistaken. And so now you've got 20, 30, 40, almost 50 megabytes. Um, and back then, this was huge at, at 10K pixels. It's sort of like, you know, with what you have in cameras now, you, you could have, you know, um, put, put the chips in the uh, same uh, computers that they used to shoot, you know, for the 1969 Man to the Moon. I mean, it's that amazing what they're doing now uh, with, with the uh, uh, microchips and what they, they're, they're putting into them. So we have a lot of development, um, even in the 70s, uh, moving slowly towards the getting the digital camera, which of course we will talk about when we hit the 1990s um, and that revolution that the digital camera came uh, and changed everything. Now, one of the other photographers on one of the highlights, Elliot Irwin, and again, um, photography sort of was divided into sort of two different areas when when you you we had what they call straight photography um which sort of was documenting realism 
and catching realism as it occurred. And we've seen a lot of that with the photo essay. Um, and um, all candidates, nothing posed. But a lot of the pictures, too, were on the other side of that, which was more um, abstract and creative and set up and, and, and kind of worked towards um, using the create, creative part of, of the uh, photography. And you, you know, you, you had a lot of different uh, types of photography. You had montages, you had uh, multimedia, where you used some photographs and different, different forms of um, uh, media in order to share your pictures. And so just some example, I mean, again, you, you started getting these wild pictures um, where you know, you've got um, sort of funny things that really uh, were kind of bizarre. And again, this is just one, one example of it. Um, and, and again, um, Mr. Irwin uh, did, was still taking serious pictures too. And this was one of the ones that he captured um, uh, back then with uh, Jackman Kennedy during the funeral. But, but again, he, he was beginning to um, explore the more artistic, creative uh, type of photography, um, which really became uh, much more popular um, in the 70s and 80s. And again, it's, it's all one genre that, that was taking place during uh, this period of time. Um, obviously, um, you, you had continuance of the many different types of photography all the way through these periods. For example, um, you know, Neil, Neil Leaf, Leafer, was it Leaper or Leiper? Um, and uh, he, he, uh, he was one of my favorite sports photographers. You saw him always uh, in, you know, Sports Illustrated um, uh, or Time Inc. And um, all of the peak moments, he was the guy that caught the peak moments. And um, again, this, this was, um, uh, you know, just one of the peak moments that he got uh, one of the championships, uh, Green Bay Packers. Um, and he was there for the big things. He never missed anything. And uh, you look at a picture and uh, he was the guy that took the picture. Uh, just amazing. Uh, one thing about great sports photographers is they, um, they have an instinct. They know where to be uh, and to get the picture. It's just, it's just unbelievable. You know, you had a lot of these photographers back here, they got just the back of um, Muhammad Ali. Um, and this is Neil Leifer would, would get, uh, constantly be in the right place at the right time to get the perfect picture. And it was his knowledge of an understanding of sports and just an instinct and um, a little luck, but it was mostly skill. So one of the great war photographers uh, back uh, in the Vietnam War was, was Larry Burroughs. He actually was, was uh, killed in action. And um, he was an, an English photojournalist. Uh, many thought he you know, could, could be American, but he was English. And um, he spent nine years covering the Vietnam War. And um, again, you notice the uh, small cameras that he used, 35 millimeters. Um, and I don't know what, what uh, brand or what model that is, but he, um, he usually, you know, I always had two cameras with him, which, which is pretty much what a true photojournalist uh, should have with him at all times. Um, and uh, so anyway, he uh, went, went through uh, the entire Vietnam War almost, and then uh, finally, um, uh, at some point, I believe he, he stepped on a landmine and unfortunately uh, was, was killed in the line of duty. Um, but, you know, he, he was so, you know, I think I alluded to last um, week that a good war photographer doesn't get good pictures unless uh, they're dodging actual bullets. Um, and so that's what he did, and he, he ended up paying with his life for it. Um, being in the midst of the danger. Um, all of these shots were, you know, part of, uh, you know, in time, life, um, all of the big uh, magazines uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s. And these pictures, you know, were etched in your mind. Uh, you never forget these images uh, that he, he had. Um, and uh, 
again, composition, you figure you get bullets dodging all over um, and you're still able to get well composed pictures. Um, it's just, just amazing. Um, and to do that, you, know, you, you stand up and take a shot and hope nobody shoots at you. You just can't um, stay in a trench to get these type of shots. Um, obviously, again, great, great visual um, approach here. Uh, just catching the action uh, and then secondarily um, composing the picture um, extremely well uh, in, in making the picture work is one of his, his again, um, got the bullet flying out of the gun. Um, you know, this was shooting at the enemy, obviously, and he was right to the right of, of the uh, soldier making this picture. Uh, just um, so much courage that um, I, I couldn't fathom doing something like this. Okay, uh, Jeff, Stanley Foreman, that's the guy. And um, he, he was the man who had two post prizes in a row. Um, and um, he was from the American uh, newspaper, the Boston Herald American. So, um, you know, we, we uh, were one thinking last week, um, it was another photographer than uh, Jeff mentioned that um, he thought it was from the Boston Herald American, and that's true. I had thought it was from the Chicago um, uh, paper, but he was from the Boston paper. And so thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. And um, so he, uh, not many uh, photographers get two in a row. Um, and again, um, he did this by living, eating, drinking, sleeping through having the camera with him all the time. It's the only way that he could pull us off. Um, and, you know, did he sit around uh, uh, with a normal life? I don't really think he did. Um, and he was able to get some of these pictures. Um, again, this was the, uh, um, the protest in, in Boston. Um, I think white supremacist, uh, white supremacist um, um, and protesters um, fighting uh, during during a, a, a protest, and then this was that tragic shot of a um, uh, fire and the collapse of the balcony where he caught the two children coming down. Um, the I believe the younger child survived, and the older child on the bottom, unfortunately, was uh, 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 killed uh, in the fall. Uh, um, so it was, um, again, uh, you don't get this, this type of shot unless you're out there all the time uh, um, in responding to uh, accidents and everything 24-7. Um, and I, I was not, my philosophy was not like that. Um, I did devote a lot of time to journalism, photojournalism, but um, I did not uh, go out at three in the morning and, and uh, follow everything around. And uh, I believe Foreman was, you know, every time the scanner went off, he was out there. So it was, it was just a total commitment on his part. We have, um, there, this is one of my favorites because I love nature photography, Stephen Dalton. And, um, you know, when you go out and you, you, you catch a peak moment, uh, it's, it's fun uh, it, with birds or with, with anything. And um, uh, Stephen Dalton was, was really a specialist in nature photography with what he uh, used with uh, high speed photography. He, would, he was able to catch um, insects and small, uh, smaller um, beings in um, uh, stop motion. And usually, you know, I mean, that's a millisecond to catch these things, and he was able to do it. And um, and so some of his work, um, you know, was just you know, unbelievable stuff. And uh, we've got, uh, again, these are a little fuzzy because uh, they were stolen from Google, but just catching um, a, um, a spider jumping from, from one acorn to another is fascinating. Um, this, of course, being a bird photographer, I love, love this shot. Um, this was um, something which um, I've, I've caught birds in, in motion before. And, uh, you know, I know J 
Jeff, you have too, and um, to, to catch the uh, the beautiful wing formations, um, I think is really really terrific because uh, you're you're catching kind of a, a peak moment in um, you know, and I think that's that's fantastic. Um, so um, this is one of one of my favorites too, which which um, I uh, you know catching something uh, right in, in the midst is. I think really uh, uh, amazing as to, to to what he did, and um, again, this is this is macro photography, but um, again, it encompasses a lot of other skills in order to to get this type of photography, and um, so that's that's pretty much a um, a strength that very few photographers have. So um, so as as you've gone through all of these um, these pictures and over the last 125 years, um, we've got two more um, two more segments to go. But uh, what what you've ended up seeing is um, due to obviously the the technological developments, um, it it broadened the ability for the photographer to be creative. And to do what he or she wanted wanted to do with uh, different types of photography, you know, whether it be shooting um, uh, medical stuff, the embryos, uh, uh, high speed photography, catching uh, insects in motion, um, the um, you know the landscape photography. I mean that again, uh, you know, developed um, more and more into um, the ability to. Uh, be more creative with with your your work because you you've got the, the the tools to use in order for you to uh, bring your creative mind to fruition and um, produce it through the tool that you're using. And of course, once you get into di digital, we'll talk about that. It, um, the creative ability uh, exploded uh, in what you were able to do uh, with the camera that, that you have in front of you. And um, the um, uh, fashion photography, for example, um, has continued uh, as, as a major force in, in photography. And um, uh, nature photography is extremely uh, strong at this point. But, you know, the, the whole um, magazine genre uh, of photography, uh, unfortunately, is, is sort of um, sliding south, and, and additionally, the newspaper uh, photojournalism is, is sliding south um, with, um, you know, fewer and fewer um, ways to, to share uh, this type of photojournalism, this type of uh, photo essay that was really popular in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. So the, the newspapers are unfortunately getting smaller. And, and the magazines are going out of business. And, and this, this whole area is, is uh, unfortunately uh, and sadly not, to, not really uh, as strong as it used to be. And um, so you do, have, you do have surviving photography, but it's, it's, it's more towards, um, you know, stuff like wedding photography and, um, you know, can you make, can you make a living uh, doing nature photography, some can, but it's it's very difficult, and um, you know you 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 have to go where the money is for the most part, part with photography, and um, uh, in this day and age, it's uh, um, there are a few and far between opportunities uh, to do that, and um, so uh, what you end up having is you have um, a huge amount of people who are taking pictures with digital cameras and sharing them um, in, in a, our social media environment. And uh, that's what I love to do. Um, I know uh, Jeff loves to do that too, is, is to, to sharing the work and, and educating people about um, the beauty of photography and what you can do. And um, so um, we've got this, um, Gentleman Ernst Haas, who was an Austrian American, and um, again he really um, was involved with 
kind of uh, documenting uh, the, the life in, in uh, America. And, um, you know, uh, um, many, many, many of, of the photographers in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were um, uh, important in, in that, e that end of things. And so, you know, as I said, what are we doing now uh, to do this type of documentary work? Um, I think it's, it's something which is sorely uh, missing. And again, uh, accurate reporting, both uh, with photographic reporting and with um, actual uh, reporters covering the news is in, a, in, in dire straits at this particular point. And um, so will it ever come back uh, to the photo essay, photojournalism? Um, I don't think it will. I think the, unfortunately, uh, the market is not there. Um, I, and I, I certainly am very sad about that. Um, as, but the, the fun with the digital stuff uh, is there and uh, we'll, we'll also get into that soon. I'm gonna pop back to um, uh, get back to all of you here. And um, so um, in any case, um, I was going to um, mention that um, the um, main subject uh, we're gonna be doing uh, 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 is is going to be um, you know the, the start of the digital, which really took took place in you know the um, mid to late 90s. So we're going to have to slide through the next uh, uh, 20 years, um, where you you had um, sort of a tr beginning of a transition period um, uh, starting, and, um, and then then about 2000 2005. Um, the last segment that we'll be doing is, um, is, is the true digital age, which took over a very revolutionary um, uh, a period of time where everything seems to change. And um, so what you ended up doing, for example, with, um, with newspapers is that instead of having a photo staff uh, that um, was there and needed to have the skills to do uh, darkroom work, um, you would end up having a reporter taking a, a digital camera and um, able to pop out pictures and then simply upload them to the computer. And so there was a transition there because of the digital revolution of, um, of the um, wet darkroom becoming extinct. And additionally, on top of that, the actual photographers uh, started to become extinct um, and you ended up having um, uh, news reporters uh, becoming photographers. So um, that's not to say that there are gifted um, uh, journalists that have uh, an ability to write and to take great pictures. That, that is certainly the case. But um, the, the trained photojournalist um, is few and far between now and um, that's one of the things that the uh, digital rev revolution has um, has affected. And um, uh, however, for the, the enthusiast um, out there um, that, that love to take pictures, um, I think the digital is, is, is a wonderful um, uh, development. And um, um, I, I certainly am 100% um, for this, this uh, way of taking pictures, you can, like today, I took 50 pictures, uh, of which you can erase 45 of them. So um, I can uh, now afford to take 50 pictures and not have to buy the film for it. And um, um, that's, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Um, so um, anyone else uh, have any particular um, thoughts that you, um, I think De Debbie was mentioning the, the um, uh, 70s pictures that um, I sent through the video. And um, so again, it's, um, um, you know, I'm trying to share some videos uh, with you uh, rather than you having to um, sit through them uh, here at the uh, presentation. I'm trying to send out a couple every week. and. Um, um, and, and basically um, dealing with some of the specialty things versus uh, 
you know, the, the old, the very general history of photography. Um, but um, in any case, um, any thoughts on anything we've gone over in the last session or the last five weeks at this point? Anyone have any input? My dad. Uh, is my voice coming through? Yes. What, what's that? Am I, is my voice coming through? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, it is, Joe. My dad bought one of the first available Polaroid cameras, and uh, he bought every accessory that was available different lenses, uh, filters, uh, a separate range finder, a flash attachment, and the big case. And of course, that was in the days when you had the, the little sponges that you had to use to develop the film and then to fix it. Um, it stunk like heck. Um, I used to love that smell. <laughs> yes, um, but he, Oh gosh, he took that every place. And I think he kind of considered himself almost like a photojournalist with the with the the shoulder bag and everything. He even bought stock in Polaroid. And at one point he felt he had to sell it, which was too bad um, because if he had held on to it another number of years, he would have been quite wealthy. But anyway, um, I remember that we used to go to a nearby hill and during thunderstorms and take pictures of lightning, which I guess a lot of photographers have done. But he mentioned one time a friend at work, he worked for the phone company. So a lot of them were into photography and different technical hobbies. Uh, but a friend mentioned a new Polaroid high-speed film. It turned out to be 400 ASA, black and white. But um, that was considered really high-speed high film at the time. And uh, what, what was just ironic is later, in, in, later on, when I got interested in photography, he had teased me for buying all these the different lenses and filters and when I reminded him of his Polaroid he said well it was different then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that was a great story Joe. Um, so yeah the um, the Polaroid uh, you know was um, used by professionals as kind of a, a field test camera um, back um, for you know studio work um, you know they they would uh, take the high end Polaroid camera and uh, they would test their lighting and they would test um, um, you know all of all of their all of the, what they were doing on their Polaroids uh, to see how everything was working um, before they set up their fancy um, film cameras that you know the film was five six seven dollars um, maybe uh, each uh, for these huge uh, film plates. So they'd use this, the, essentially what we do with the digital. Um, now, of course, is we, we have the, the ability to have that digital cameras as kind of the new Polaroid. We're able to see exactly what we've shot uh, in the field, so to speak, and um, go from there, which I do all the time. And, you know, at first I thought it was cheating in a sense, because I, you know, in the old days, you used to think you had to do everything in order to plan and get the picture um, um, without sort of cheating and seeing what you, what mistakes you're making before you take the picture. So anyway, the, the, the whole concept of digital, I think, is good because you can see the minute things that you might want to change in some of your test shots and then make those changes digitally, whether it's uh, people or landscape, whatever. I'm sure, um, I can't speak for Jeff, but I'm sure that he uses camera to um, 
um, you know, to, to, to see what he's got and to make, uh, you know, make uh, changes that way. Um, I, no, I, I just, I plan, I plan out the picture. I line it up. I take one picture and I'm done. Um, I was expecting <laughs> that um, comment from you, Jeff. Um, it, I get and, it right and, in the camera. Right. Is it? Is that your Ansel Adams philosophy? Um, no, that that was never Ansel Adams. Well, yeah, he yeah, did. But, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Jeff takes one picture. I have. I take about twenty or thirty, <laughs> um, and so I'm getting there. I, I hope to, to to achieve the that one shot. Um, and, and so the beauty of it is that if you do have a, um, a, a way to look at what you're doing and um, you, you can see the minute, minute adjustments that you have, although the ability for you to set things up should be um, there uh, to begin with um, when, you're, when you're setting, seriously, when you're setting stuff up, you should know the, the, um, what the camera and the lens can do backwards and forwards before you take the shot. Um, and then, of course, there's post-production, which we'll talk about, too, in, in the, digital, the digital age, which um, many of us um, use um, and feel it's very important. Um, I know, you know, obviously, Jeff has Photoshop and Lightroom. I use uh, both of those. Um, do any of you uh, other folks uh, work on your pictures with software? Oh, I'm a big fan of cropping my pictures. <laughs> okay, cropping, good. Yeah, good. I don't. They don't seem close enough to me, so I like to. Yeah, yeah that's well, always that's, that's, that's good. very simple to do. You don't need to be a genius to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's important. It's important to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Joe, you you say you uh, you still take pictures? Yes. Um, a year ago, I got a new uh, Canon. Uh, digital, of course, um, that had or that has the equivalent of a 12 or 1500 millimeter lens. Um, and that's optical zoom, not mm -hmm. digital. And the first photo I took, and if I can find it in the computer, I'll, I could show you, but I was uh, at my house, about a hundred feet away from a big um, uh, milkweed patch up in my field, and I just put it on maximum zoom, aimed it towards the milkweeds, and actually found a little caterpillar Aww. and mm. took a photo of the caterpillar. It was it was easily 100, 150 feet away, and I took it, and I mean, talk about beginner's luck, because there was no camera shake or anything. Wow. It was absolutely amazing, and it was worth, I don't know, it was a, an amazingly low price. It was about $130, mm -hmm. and it also takes absolutely beautiful uh, macro F uh, photographs that absolutely amazing what they can do now and and again that's without the digital zoom mm. it, it is amazing Joe um, I um, I took the, the American Kestrel uh, Hawk some of you I was sharing at the beginning of the uh, program but um, the, the, uh, the I'd say the Kestrel was probably a good 200, 300 feet away. And um, I've got a, a, a roughly 21 megapixel camera. And um, I'm not saying it's, it's gonna be a full frame uh, beauty, but I was able to get um, fairly close with, um, um, you know, uh, with my cropping because of the high megapixel quality of, of the camera. And that's one, one thing that uh, you know, it's good to, for bird photography because you can't always fill the frame with your, your um, image of the bird because it is difficult to get that close. And the, the whole idea is that the uh, high-end megapixels combined with a regular lens, like a 300 millimeter, 400 millimeter, you're able to really um, uh, tighten up the picture quite a bit without losing a lot of 
uh, resolution, and, and you know that's what you were referring to, Joe. And um, so if you um, if you look at the digital um, um, development, what what you end up doing, in my mind, is um, you're saving yourself in many cases from uh, having a 600 millimeter lens um, by getting, let's say, a digital camera that's got 20 or 30 megapixels in the uh, sensor. Um, and you're able to do that for $1,500, $2,000. Um, whereas if you've got a 600 millimeter uh, high-end lens, um, that's usually three, four, five thousand dollars um, $5,000 if you've got, you know, getting a fancy lens. So that, that helps a great deal. Um, so you're, you're able to uh, save money on lenses in many cases because of the high-end digital cameras uh, out there. Um, Jeff, you got any thoughts on all of this stuff? Well, I think what Joe was talking about, he probably has one of the uh, cameras with a fixed zoom lens on it, not, not interchangeable. And it's amazing the, right. uh, the range that you can get with, uh, with these uh, cameras that have relatively small sensors. Uh, I've got I've got a Canon 50x or something like that, and it's it's 50x. So I so um, I can go from uh, from 24 millimeters to 1200 millimeters, you know. And you can say, well, it's too bad you can't change lenses, but you don't need to change lenses when you can do that much. I bought it for Susan; she absolutely refuses to touch it, so I have it now. <laughs> But it uh, it was it's great to take on on trips and uh, I I had tried to get her to take it when we went to Alaska so she could take pictures of bears from a safe distance. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, those cameras are remarkable. You do you trade you trade off a smaller sensor, um, and that you know as as you get to bigger cameras with bigger sensors, you get better quality. But it also requires you to spend more money on the glass to to get anything close to an equivalent zoom. Um, uh, magnification of those things, but you can get really neat stuff with a, a camera that's easy to carry around and uh, gives you great range. It is, it is, yes. Thanks, Jeff. It's, 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 it's amazing what they're developing now technologically, and um, and just to flip it, slip it in, in into your pocket, um, and and um, yes, the trips instead of um, carrying. 10 or 15 pounds. I had one trip where um, I was, I got the, uh, had my camera and, and uh, you know, a 400 millimeter lens and I was pulled out of line by um, the um, uh, folks that kind of check you at the airports, TSA. And, um, you know, he wanted to check to make sure I didn't have a, a rocket uh, embedded into the lens. <laughs> He's asking me all sorts of questions like, uh, uh, "What's the? Uh, that's that's pretty fast. Uh, what's the f-stop?" Uh, and I said, "Well, I don't know. I, it's really not a camera. It's just designed to be a missile." And <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Um, but um, in any case, uh, you don't have to worry about that much anymore when when you you have those smaller cameras, which um, are able to do. Um, a lot, and as Jeff uh, said, um, you you are sacrificing a little bit of quality um, you know, for for getting some easy stuff to travel with. But um, it it's amazing um, because 15, 20 years ago, you had point and shoots that were pretty much garbage, and now the uh, point and shoots are 20 megapixels, 25 megapixels, uh, and they're point and shoots. So. You can um, get amazing photos with them now, which is which is uh, which is really good. A lot of the point and so, shoot market is being replaced by by the uh, smartphones that you can get remarkable pictures. I I did an article a week before last about <clears throat> doing macro photography, all the little buds, and one of the things I did with my iPhone Seven just to show the how how you could do. And the, a lot of these iPhones have remarkably close focus and wide uh, depth of field. So uh, uh, you can get uh, uh, surprisingly good pictures. Can I share a screen? Yeah. Uh, um, you're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too, uh, oh. Can boy, anyone see I, that? There he is. Wow. You guys see that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, taken yeah. With, that's taken with an iPhone 7. 
Oh boy. It's a rhododendron. That's beautiful. But you can do remarkable work with these things. Uh, um, so in terms of pocket cameras, you know, the, uh, the iPhones and the smartphones are replacing a lot of that stuff. Oh my um, goodness. Although you don't, you know, if you tried to push it and, um, you know, tried to blow it up, you, you'd start noticing it would fall apart because the, the sensors in these iPhones are, are, are minis really tiny. Um, but you can still get decent pictures. With these yeah, how many uh, megabytes is the camera phone itself now, Jeff, that you have roughly? Huh. Oh, I, am, I am honestly not sure. Maybe um, I think they're I think they're somewhere around ten ten to thirteen. Yeah, you can right. you can get you can get up there now. I mean this is this is just a seven. So I mean they're better now. Hey Jeff, um, is this Photoshop? Oh excuse me? Was this Photoshop at all? Uh Lightroom didn't Photoshop, yeah. yeah so this this, if, this if isn't out of the eye. Can you see my arrow on his picture? So Jeff Can you Jeff, see my um, arrow on the picture? Yeah, I uh, Point to right here, Jeff. So Jeff does a. Um, are you back to your weekly blogs? Um, not entirely weekly. I'm trying. I'm trying to do a series on just um, what I call isolation photography, talking about what you can do around the house. I did one on taking pictures macros indoors, and the last two I've been sort of following what's going on outdoors this this the spring stick yeah. season and now getting into some of the buds. Um, and over the next week or two, things are just going to explode in terms of, of the buds on the tree. So there's so lots, there's folks, lots you can do. Um, listening, um, you, uh, and, and Jeff's done this blog, how many years now, uh, for the blogs, 10, 12? Yeah, around, I think 10 or 12, I could go back. Yeah. So he, he has hundreds and hundreds of, um, inform, informative pieces in his blogs um, uh, that he's compiled over the years. And you can find this um, uh, at his website um, at harpersbrookreflections.com. And um, it, it gives you uh, so much insight into the different uh, types of uh, you know, photo equipment and uh, different approaches to uh, photography, um, the, the um, yeah, tons of stuff and um, beautiful photography um, uh, to illustrate it. And um, so, I mean, basically, I keep telling Jeff, he, he should put a book together on this, but um, it's- Thank um, you, Steve. He's, yeah, he's, he's cut it all on, on film, on digital. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll share absolutely half of my profits from it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I got I to give you my screen back here. I think I can do that here. Stop. Okay. You back? That, that's good to know. Thank you for 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 um, popping in that information and that the. the yeah, well, people uh, think they need there. they need you know all sorts of expensive stuff to take some nice nice close up pictures of, of all sorts of interesting things, but you can you can do it decently with a with a just an iPhone or or with a point and shoot. Yeah. Good point. And um, the the. Um, of course, the, the iPhones and, and the Androids, uh, you also can get uh, telephoto attachments uh, for them to try to get um, some form of, um, you know, some semblance of, of maybe getting uh, birds, wildlife, whatever, in, in a better situation. I haven't ever tried that uh, with it because I've, I've got the other lenses uh, with the digital cameras, but. They're making quality uh, telephoto lenses for the iPhones, et cetera, now um, that you can, you can put on the front of the, um, uh, the lens that's there on your iPhone huh. and um, get some great, great stuff. So the, it just, you, you name it, you can do it with, a, with an iPhone now. And I think I met, may have mentioned before, but um, there are some films, uh, feature films that have been made with the, um, the video uh, on iPhones. Yeah. Um, that, um, um, again, you would, you know, um, Ken Burns is not quite there yet, but, um, you, you, you can, you can get some quality stuff. Um, so that, uh, is just amazing what you can do now with, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm sure that there are, are photojournalists, newspaper guys, magazine guys that are out there that, um, that use the uh, iPhone uh, Android technology uh, for some of their stuff. Um, they're not 
they're not poo pooing it anymore. So that's that's really um, the amazing development. You bet that at all in this this very tiny tiny unit is just just amazing. So um, I uh, I think that um, you know uh, the, the whole idea of having a very heavy lens with a heavy camera with a, uh, several lenses for trips now is almost extinct. Um, with with the quality point and shoots and the quality smartphones that you've got, still lugging stuff around. <laughs> yeah, still lugging stuff around. Yeah, well, I mean, if you've got it, you should you should use the best of the best, I think. And um, especially, um, you know, when um, you know you 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 can't um, not um, admit that um, the the lenses with a good glass in them. Um, the cameras with the big sensors in them um, are the thing to have for the top, top quality uh, that you need for, um, you know, for really, really professional looking pictures. And um, I don't think you're ever going to avoid um, having, you know, to do that for the, for the super quality stuff. And that, that I think is very important. Um, but now you can at least get some, some good images uh, for that, that small a unit that you're carrying around in your suitcase or your um, So um, thank you for sharing some of those stories. And um, I uh, <clears throat> am um, gonna, gonna sign off this week unless somebody has, has some, some more thoughts. Um, try to, I'm gonna try to find some interesting videos um, to share to you. I had, I had one uh, done by the Muppets that I, uh, <laughs> I uh, thought was pretty, was pretty hilarious. But um, I, I, anyway, the, um, I think um, there, it's amazing what, what you can find on, um, when you go to Google and you, you go to Google video, you, there's, I came up with like 40 or 50 different, um, um, you know, subjects with the history of photography. Um, you kind of wonder, I mean, some of them were done by um, Time Life, some were done by George Eastman House. I mean, there's some quality stuff out there. So if you want to, you know, just sort of cruise and you've got some time to, uh, um, uh, to do so, um, you know, um, that's what I, I would suggest going to, you know, Google um, images and then go to the videos. And they have uh, excellent material out there on um, all sorts of different fascinating things about uh, the history of cameras, the history of, uh, you know, uh, photographers uh, over the last 200 years. And um, it's sort of fun kind of uh, working your way through those. Um, so that's, that's a, an excellent resource um, out there. Um, so uh, yes, so next, next week will be 1980 to 1999. And then finally, 2000 to 2019, 2020. So we got 40, 40 more years to go. And uh, we've covered about 140. So uh, we're getting there. And thank you very much, thank everybody. You. you have a week. You too. Bye -bye. Yeah. We'll Thanks, Steve. Next week. Thank, thank you. you. Keep well. Yeah. Yes. Bye-bye, yes. Francine. Bye. Take care. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody.